Bula and welcome to another segment of The Lens at 177, an original production of the Fiji Times. Today we have the Assistant Minister for Women, Children and Social Protection, Sashi Kiran. Ms. Kiran, thank you for uh, being on the show today despite your busy schedule and back-to-back -back meetings. Bula <laughs> Vinaka to you and to the viewers. Bula Vinaka, Bula Vinaka. Um, first year uh, anniversary of the coalition government, you being a cabinet minister as well as a first year a member of parliament. How was your first year in government and what are some of the highlights? Thank you. Well, uh, I'm not a cabinet minister. Only ministers are in the cabinet and right. assistant ministers are not in the cabinet. It has been a very interesting journey, mm -hmm. um, completely different from what I used to do. So it was a huge, steep learning. Even though from outside you watch the government and you think the decisions they are making, we critique it. But when you are in the system, it's quite different. So it was a lot yeah. of learning for how is the parliament run, um, you know the theory, but you know the practicalities of it. Uh, how is the government run, uh, the challenges of the government uh, system. I come from a, an NGO background uh, and I'll see a problem and look at a solution. It was, it was more simplistic than working through all your policies and you know um, and the entire machinery. So first few months was a huge learning and, and, and seemed uh, pretty difficult. However, uh, you recognize pretty rapidly that uh, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, I was able to work with my ministry, but work across ministries with Minister for Youth in working with the youth uh, employment uh, uh, networks uh, with the private sector. I was able to work with the Prime Minister's office um, uh, on working on termites, um, something that previous governments hadn't looked at. There are many houses, if you poke your finger through it, it can go right through, uh, that's how badly they're infested, you know, the walls yeah. and, and the soft timber. So, uh, they, and there's a huge knowledge gap, so that was another area um, that I've been working on. Um, uh, within our ministry, uh, it's quite sad to see the issue of children, orphanages and or orphans and elderly. Um, I guess a big highlight for me was also for the first time in my life, putting a motion and defending a motion and yeah. a motion getting through, which was on truth and reconciliation. Something um, that the Prime Minister has been very passionate about, and it responds to my calling for me personally, uh, you know, I've been doing this work on uh, healing relationships for the last decade yeah. with the chiefs in Ba province and also in Rewa province. So, yeah, that's, that was quite a year for me. <laughs> Impressive. Um, you've brought up the issue of termites, one of the um, issues that you deal with your ministry. What's the update on this uh, um, since you've been covering the Western Division that's been covered uh, a lot uh, for, on this issue? So this is really Prime Minister's office uh, because uh, biosecurity is under them, uh, under Prime Minister's office, in partnership with strategic planning. Um, Honorable Tumbuna has been chairing um, a task force, which I've been working with him on the task force. Um, so one, we uh, have a huge knowledge gap. So we've been working with um, other countries who can tell us how to deal with this. Um, there are some practices which are not effective, like burning uh, termites uh, or burning the fires or just uh, putting, uh, you know, spraying on it. Mm -hmm. Um, termites live underground and the colonies are underground and that means we need to bait and kill the termites. So over the process of learning we have uh, called for tender, for baiting and uh, we have asked the people in the in Lotokabana and areas to register with the DOs and uh, the baits will be made available to all those um, uh, districts and there's also a process of recognition and uh, giving of assistance to those houses that are damaged. Now the assistance is very small, um, but it's some assistance towards the soft timber that's in the house that gets affected. Right. Uh, that's being rolled out under the Ministry of Strategic Planning in partnership, uh, under the leadership of uh, Honorable Tumuna and uh, the uh, Minister for Planning. Uh, for the benefit of our followers, uh, w what do you mean when you say bait? So, you know, they like you have a rat bait. Yeah. You have actually the bait that is put 
around your house um, and a bait covers certain square meters mm -hmm. and this bait is taken by the termites into their colony. Uh, the mother uh, or the, the mother worm that's there lays like thousand eggs um, a day and it has a life of 25 years. So they keep um, um, growing in colony under your houses. So if you just spray it and say remove your soft timber that's gone bad and put a new one, they'll still affect your infest your house. And they go through any gaps in the cement or anywhere and you'll see even in through cement and tiles they're able to come into people's houses. We've had really bad stories of ceiling falling in, mm -hmm. um, you know, entire houses being decimated. Yeah. So now we are trying to make sure that when people are rebuilding, that they bait the area and kill the colonies. Mm -hmm. And we're learning from Queensland in Australia where they do this. Um, we found some bait there is much cheaper as well. We're trying to get expertise to teach us how to not only bait once, but keep on monitoring it um, so that because unfortunately that's a reality. Also very little known is apparently the, when the termites fly, that's not when they're spreading. Termite can only spread from one place to the other by transfer of soil or infested timber. So we've seen, like say, somebody uh, realizes they have timber that's in, uh, damaged, they remove it, they put new timber. And they'll say to somebody, oh, you can take it and burn it or you know, use this timber. This is the infested timber. When you take the timber and put it in your compound, mm -hmm. wherever it sits, the termite goes right in. So then you keep spreading it. Um, you have to actually dispose that uh, you know, immediately. So it's spreading through infested timber and it's also tr spreading through movement of soil. So the soil that is infested and is taken. Right. Um, so there has to be a lot of uh, work around and policies around that to stop people, especially from Lotoka, which is a red zone, moving any soil or any timber into other areas. But there's a lot of work, there's a lot of awareness needed and all that work. Uh, you know, tenders take yeah. time, processes take time. Yeah. So you'll be hearing much more of that in the next few weeks. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Kirana. Um, for the past uh, few weeks, few months, we've had a lot of issues that are um, covered by the ministry that that's been covered extensively within the media and one of the issues was, is uh, unclaimed bodies oh. yeah um, it, it drew a lot of attention when it came out uh, what are some of your thoughts on these issues sadly unclaimed bodies has been an issue um, it is under the jurisdiction of Ministry of Health when I first joined I had a letter from SPEN because at that time it was normally when there are unclaimed bodies from street dwellers and things, then ministry, our ministry used to uh, bury it. So that's where the approach was made. There were eight bodies lying in Lotoka at that time. And Espen, out of frustration, had written to me, and then we had facilitated a process of, uh, you know, uh, finding final rights for some of them, for four bodies and others uh, I think were claimed, there were some forensic. And that time we did find out that there were four bodies in, in CWM. And we've been trying to get a process going. Now you, you cannot just take the body and you know do the final rights. Yeah. We'd reached out to organizations and Sanatan Dharam had come forward and said we're happy to do you know the final rights. Most of them are people from Indian origin. And, uh, but there's a process to it. Yeah. So the uh, Ministry of Health has you have to call out for relatives, you have to do the legal work, otherwise somebody can come back and you know claim and say why did you bury the body or so all the legalities are being done mm -hmm. and as soon as that's all finished then Sanatan Dharam has come forward and said they will do um, the final rights for all four with proper all the rights. So it's great, we there are wonderful partners out there but it is very sad to see that people are being left um, like that. Yeah. They must have had connections, relationships, yes. you know, some of them died at home, so people knew they had died and they were brought to CWM. On the same note, I'll tell you, a um, few days ago I was told of an amputee left in the hospital. He has relatives and family members, but nobody wants to take him, so he has to be taken to the home. And you will see uh, some of the people I visited over Christmas um, during in, in our homes, in our HK homes, 
people who come from places where they have family members, but they're just neglected and left in homes of state care. So generally there is a neglect and something has happened to a society that it's broken down so badly that we're leaving our elderly, our people living with disabilities and dead the way we have. And I'm hoping that we can have a consciousness where we can shift it. You're watching The Lens at 177. We will be right back after this. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. You're watching The Lens at 177 and I'm speaking with the Assistant Minister for Women, Children and uh, Social Protection, Sashi Kiran. Ms. Kiran, um, on the issue of children on the streets, I, I commute every day by the public transport to and from work and every day I, I meet them along the way when I go home. So, um, and it seems to be increasing every time I I, I see them, they seem to be increasing uh, and they, you know, or every time we meet they ask for money, probably for food. So what is the issue on, on the street kids? Why, why are they out there? One, they're not asking for money for food. <laughs> and I know every time I've said that people have gotten really angry with me. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're finding, and I have been physically going on the streets, meeting them. Uh, I have gone at nights to talk to them and meet them. And with Minister for Youth, we actually went into a house where they were living. And you know, we picked quite a few of them to put them into different training centers. Very, very sadly, uh, many of these kids are hooked onto glue and drugs. And sadly, the money that you do give them doesn't go towards food. It goes towards glue and drugs. Okay. And like I said earlier, it's not only the broken down society. So, so there's a handful of people, um, one of the partners we're working with met at Mangroves in, in, in here. Um, girls, young girls, uh, youngest nine, all sitting and sniffing glue. Different stories. One said she was beaten until she was almost unconscious, so she's left the family. Um, one talked about uh, being abused at home, sexually abused by stepfather, so she's left the family. So we do see the breaking down of society is bringing them to the streets, and then it's peers. Once you know somebody's there, others are finding their way down to the streets. In the olden days, there were greater safety nets, and if a family had collapsed, their relatives or the, you know, the extended family would pick them up. Um, so we, ha we do have to relook at how we are working with our society. But we have a very prevalent problem of drugs. And our children are getting hooked onto it and they're not able to get off it. Um, over Christmas I spent a lot of time with organizations working with street uh, dwellers. In Latoka there are two and, um, organizations we worked with. I went and met with some of these kids during the day while they were sheltering in this place, they were stoned, completely stoned. And we are actually, um, I broke down and I cried listening to some of the stories. As young as nine and 10 year olds are using injection. So there's a lot of use of needles rather. So, you know, sharing of needles. Um, some of the shelters, two of the shelters talked about how when the kids are, um, this is Christmas, they're using their hand, the veins, but they're also hitting a vein in the head. And one of the shelter talked about, uh, so there's this person in Bonato who's just put a tent out there and toilets for them to come and rest. They've seen infected wounds, they've taken them to hospital. Very sadly, some of the cases where they've taken them for testing and found HIV positive kids, very young. So 
I think while we have a major issue of uh, families bro broken down, broken down families, we also have this disease, this, uh, you know, mega evil amongst us that our children are getting hooked to. And it's easier to come on the, on the streets, perhaps, because that's where the drugs take you. Um, one of the things, very sadly, many reports from Nandi in particular in Lotoka, where when they're on a high or when they're in withdrawal, they walk around town naked. I've had a couple of cases reported. We've sent uh, people. So as a society, I think we need to look at our issue of drugs. Um, many of the kids, we're taking them back, reintegrating them in their families, they're back on the streets. So obviously things are not right at home also. Uh, beggars, we've taken them back. Some of them we've established, you know, with homes and income generation, they come back mm -hmm. on the streets. Um, and it's hard to say whether the numbers are going higher. Um, I know there's greater visibility of the issue, so many people have been saying it's going up, the numbers. Yeah. We've been monitoring it. Uh, there's roughly 140 in Suva that we identify, similar numbers in the West. Many get on a bus and travel up and down. Yeah. Some of them I met in Lotoka, and some of the children had run away, 10, 12 year olds, they were found in Suva. Mm -hmm. um, even though many partners have come along to help these children, so we have got different organizations, we are trying to get them into training. We can't, and we tried some last year. We put some in jobs and we put some of them into training institutes, then they start influencing others because yeah. we haven't taken them to a de addiction program. So right now we're working with organizations on drug de-addiction program. We desperately need a drug rehabilitation center. Uh, there's that we recognize that as a, nation, as a government. So it's a multi-pronged problem and I think this problem has been there for too long. Um, and we don't have the necessary support system and facilities. And it's taking, it's quite a challenge to make all that happen in a very short time. I must say I'm grateful to many partners and yeah. NGOs and faith-based groups who've come forward. There's some very passionate people in this who have worked day and night, they spend the evenings with these children. So we get regular feedback on the problems. The solutions, we don't have, uh, like I said, drug addiction center, we don't have experts on drugs. We are finding all kinds of drugs. When, we've, when I first started, it seemed like it was a glue thing, but now you have meth, you have ice, there's cocaine found on our streets. So the beast is much bigger than we can tackle right now. Thank you. Uh, on the um, issue of uh, um, sexual offenses and non-sexual offenses on children, uh, we've uh, had actually the ODPP office sends out a monthly mm -hmm. statistics to uh, to the media, uh, indicating that you know there there are victims every month. Children are victims of sexual and non-sexual uh, violence, and um, some of the uh, perpetrators or the uh, suspects are their own uh, family members. What uh, is the e ministry doing about this? Again, it's a whole of society problem. Huh? Uh, you have seen in the news and you have seen the data that the use of pornography or download of pornography in Fiji is huge. Um, in the olden days when I've, when I've been in the communities, I've been, I've, you know, people have shared in the villages that around grog balls, uh, older men talk to the younger boys about pornography and show them pornography and introduce them to sex. So unfortunately, if as a society, we have, like it's prevalent in the society to talk about pornography or see these visuals, if adults do it with children in front of the children, then I guess they don't see it that they're doing a wrong in committing these sexual offenses. Over the years, 70% of all sexual crimes have been with children or young girls below the age of 18. That is a very state, sorry state of affairs for Fiji. And again, it'll have to be a whole of society approach. As parents, we need to see where our children are, who are they with. Uh, as grandparents, as a society, as religious leaders, there's a lot that needs to be done. 
Now, um, again, I'll tell you that some of the communities, settlements, villages, I'm not telling you anything new, are overcrowded homes. Uh, when people are drinking grog, adults, uh, I, in one particular village where crime was quite high and I worked with that community, the girls would say, well, you know, people come from, you know, other places and are living in this place for jobs. And they, in very overcrowded homes, they're older men, younger men, and young girls all in the same space. So the abuse becomes a norm. And I'll also tell you, uh, uh, one thing that I also very saddens me is, if you see on social media or anywhere, I don't know what we've done as a society, we make fun of. Like, there's a lot of jokes and sexual jokes said in you know, Zest, and it's an accepted norm. And you know, you have all these kind of jokes and things made as if we are normalizing sexual language and the way we behave with each other. And that all contributes because our children are watching this behavior. So I think it has, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's been going on for some time, but as a whole of society, we need to relook, recheck what are we going to do for, to fix it. And not, government cannot do it alone. We all have to do it. All stakeholders have to come in and look at how we are protecting our children and looking after our children so they don't go through this abuse. Thank you. You're watching The Lens at 177, and we will be right back after this. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. You're watching The Lens at 177 and I'm speaking with the Assistant Minister for Women, Children and Social Protection, Sashi Kiran. Ms. Kiran, uh, post-apartum depression. What is the extent of this condition among women in Fiji? Ah. <laughs> I can't, I don't have research on me. I did uh, try looking for this research some time ago because I've been raising this issue. There's not a lot of research, there's no research available. Okay. I had asked the Permanent Secretary for Health last year for this. They do talk about some admission and some depression, but there's no research and data done. However, when I spoke with, so I've been uh, trying to ask the workplaces to think about how do we make women's a mental health uh, an issue or you know an awareness around it and some of the results managers have talked to me about um, how postpartum depression actually uh, has been recognized as uh, a big factor where they lose women from workforce and women who've gone through it to talk about struggles three to nine months some women don't come out of it you know some have prolonged because there's no recognition of the issue yeah. and there is no support available for that issue. And in Fijian, what do you call it? Um, the VUCA. The VUCA. And in villages, it's becoming very prominent and even on the streets, we're seeing women with mental health issues yeah. and some with children. But it's an issue that we haven't paid attention to. Okay. Many of these women who are giving birth and are not feeling supported might be going through this and uh, an attention to the issue may be able to help them come out of it. So there's an urgent need for this conversation on postpartum uh, depression uh, in workplaces, in our communities, in our families. And one thing I bag of Fiji is let's stop making fun. If you see a woman going through hell, we call it the VUCA and all sorts of things, yeah. can we find help for these women? Can we help, for, you know, can we find help instead of ridiculing these women? And then at workplaces also there are other issues like aging, you know, women aging and having health issues, uh, you know, menopause and, and uh, related issues. Things that every woman goes through or many women go through, but it's amazingly not part of our daily conversations uh, in workplaces. Violence against women, you know, there is an awareness on that. But this is a very real issue and thank you for bringing it up and I'm hoping this conversation can, and I've called and spoken with the um, Employers Federation, I'm speaking with 
other parties to see how can some of these organizations uh, pay attention to the issue and make it an awareness, a consciousness around their workplaces. Thank you. Um, social media, it's a very concern in Fiji. Uh, so uh, cyberbullying is uh, very prevalent as well. Uh, do you have statistics of no. um, um, women being cyberbullied within your ministry? Do you have reports? Uh, no, I think that goes to online commission. Uh, uh, I mean the safety commission, uh, online safety commission. And that commissioner may be able to give you stats. I think from what I read in the news, it was something like 1,400 complaints they had received. And so many women are probably not complaining. Um, but children, uh, we are told, are finding bullying an issue on social media. Children shouldn't be on social media, but they are. Uh, many women, so I've been trying to actively encourage women into leadership positions. And going around asking women whether they will take in, come into leadership, and especially municipal election, there's a huge fear around cyberbullying, right. um, being ridiculed using social media, and social media has such a huge reach and a huge impact. So it is a huge challenge. What is crazy is these are humans bullying each other. Yeah. This is us bullying each other. This is all Fiji people rubbishing each other. And I'm wondering, what do we achieve by making somebody's life hell? And then people who are sharing it. I personally report anything I see in terms of any woman being humiliated. But we have to somewhere grow our consciousness as a nation yeah. and stop it and stop other people from doing it. We're not, nobody's growing. The bully will not grow himself or herself, and those sharing are not going to grow. But we are damaging some people for life by doing that. From your own perspective, are Fijians re responsible social media users? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, how will that sound? Um, but, so I've been reading this book called Happiness Hacked. Yeah. Uh, and please go and search it, it's available online as well. It talks about, it talks uh, about how social media and tech world has taken over our lives. And these are tech people. One of them is a mentor of you know, uh, the Facebook founder. And they talk about how people who develop tech don't give this access to the children and their families. Mm -hmm. But they hire experts and doctors and um, I mean behavior specialists and mathematicians to work on the social media to get you hooked on so they become billionaires. Right. But we are losing our life completely. And if you think about it, uh, and there, there's a lot of surveys of how productivity has dropped. More information is available, but you go for a small work on the online and you are stuck there for another 95% yeah. of your time. So uh, work uh, productivity has dropped, suicide has gone up, divorce rate has gone up. So social media is actually taking our life away. We're not interacting as humans anymore. And maybe that's what desensitizes to a point where you know porn has become a norm and bullying has become a norm we no longer are humans and i think fiji as a nation and our people need to claim some of that life back i don't know if that makes sense but you know we need to think it through how we use social media yeah and lastly what are the three main key things that you'd like to focus for this year well this year um a big focus of our government is going to be on truth and reconciliation commission and that's exciting work for me. Uh, it's a work that's extremely needed. Uh, and I've been focused on this since 2000. How do we build relationships? How do we heal the nation? Uh, in my past life, past work, I've uh, done some work with the chiefs of Ba province, trying to do VESA to be able to uh, you know, look at our past and how do we heal and move forward. We've done that with Rewa. Um, this is, you know, so even before coming in the government, I've been committed to this cause, and I'm grateful that our Prime Minister is very committed to it, and it, he really wants this to happen. And I'm glad that he's encouraged me to be involved in this area of work, which speaks to my heart. So I think uh, that would be a big work. Um, there's a lot of pain in our community. There's a lot of work needed for healing, and, and truth-telling in this country is you smile, so you know. Um, it's not the easiest uh, 
And our country has seen too much pain, so that's going to be a big work. Um, the other big work that I'm trying to do is uh, encourage women into decision making with all the challenges we're facing. And I've been going around the island in, uh, to all the municipal councils to try and encourage women to participate in municipal upcoming municipal elections. Uh, our women were great leaders, have always been great leaders. You look at the likes of uh, not only Honorable, uh, late uh, Honorable Tofa Vakitale, but so many women members have gone through. Our NGO sector has had women. A grassroots, we had you know women's march of 2,000 women in Bar you know years ago. So, what has stopped our women from pushing themselves into leadership? They do the work daily. So I'm trying to do that as well, and that probably would be the key things that I'll focus on this on this year. Well, Miss Kiran, as much as I want to sit here all day and talk about these issues, time has caught up with us. Thank you, Thank you again for uh, being on the show. And I uh, wish you well for uh, the coming weekend and uh, your assignments and the opening of Parliament next month. Next month. Yes. Now, Naka. And to our Naka. followers, don't forget to follow us on uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and uh, subscribe to our YouTube. That is all we have for the Lens at 177. Thank you. Mother, mother.